I'm Megan and I'm Mark Laurent and Jonathan Armstrong, who are going to start talking about busting and utilizing HOG. All right. So welcome to everybody uh, to our session here. Um, I'm Mark. Um, I'm a HOG trainer here in Germany. I'm a lighting designer and operator as well since many years. Um, freelancing for high-end systems for trainings, support, and other stuff. Maybe you've seen me before on trade shows. Um, and I like to talk about one of those topics uh, today, which a lot of people asking always questions. How do I set up my console easy for an easy busking setup scenario? And together with me is uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, Jonathan Leggy Armstrong, who's even more a master in busking because he for very very long years he was working for a dj who um he might tell a little bit more about him himself in a second and um where he needs to, or he had to busk a lot because this dj obviously didn't use any time code so up to you leggy for a second Hi, oh, yeah, that, that's me. Um, yeah, I spent eight years with David Getter, but also designed and operated for many bands and artists aside from that. So, yeah, very used to having to jump on a desk with a string going, we're going to try and get a show out of it one way or another. Well, hopefully, Mark is going to show us, and we're going to show you a good way of setting up the console to do this. So, Mark. Good. So let's start it. Where do I have my little cheat sheet <laughs> so that I can have everything there so that I don't forget anything? All right. Um, what I will do, I will start. Um, I will do a screen sharing. Wait, uh, where is it? Just a second. Here we go. So this should work now. Uh, let me open up the chat, this one. That I can see these windows and the QA. So, a little bit about, a little bit about, the, about the housekeeping. So, if you have any um, questions regarding uh, stuff I'm talking about, um, feel free to type that into the QA. This is something where then we can follow up, um, where you can answer those questions um, there. Um, so we we will see them um so that's fine so leggy can answer them or megan can uh can answer them as well um and um if there's any specific stuff i should repeat they also will stop me and they will interrupt me from talking or even sometimes will jump in and add some little stuff um yeah so let's just go ahead um the first thing when you just look at my screen here um that's basically it's not fully done yet it's just the the way i start um organizing my console is that i make a lot of http groups here so these http groups is um so everything on a fader basically is just uh needs to be on a fader only what really needs to be fader what needs to be scaled so that's intensity or when we talk later on about effect scaling um or time scaling that's also something that should be on a fader or in any way controllable in a scalable way um all the other stuff um i do i tend to do that from um from the screen with uh, buttons or from the command keys down here because i don't actually need um, a fader to work with those stuff so with that layout i can really work with 10 to 20 faders um even without the need or have like a lot of wings or a lot of faders because uh, the hawk gives us a lot of options um to control our parameters to control our lists and scene in a um, lot of different ways so first started um like i said i do a lot of um http groups so what i have here in my little example here i have one http group um for the front spots i have one um, http group for my front washes and that continues throughout uh, all my um uh, fixture groups i have um basically i don't make any difference in the front lighting stuff um they only make two groups what I tend to do is when it comes to backdrop stuff, 
Um, I also use only two faders, but what I do there um, is I make several cues here. So as you see, I have that back truss. These are two faders. And when we look at that back truss cue list here, um, this cue list has one cue. Uh, first of all, they are set all to in the options to be queue only. So they then don't we have any um, tracking uh, values in these queue lists. So in the first queue list, I only do like a spot queue. So that means all spots. Then I do like half of the spots and the same thing, half of the spots in the symmetrical selection. So this is, might be odds ones. And on my other queue list here on master four, that might be the even ones. Um, and these are always then combined. So I have a back truss, um, two back truss faders, which depending on in which queues I'm in, I can either way control the spots and washes, or I have like, um, odd and even selection so that I can make nice uh, bump stuff uh, on the flash button, um, as you can see here. And um, also um, the same style in a symmetrical layout. Um, so, so because I'm a lazy guy and I don't want to push uh, two buttons all the time, I tend to link these queue lists as well. So whenever I'm in the wash queue list, uh, wash queue in that um, queue list, I trigger with that macro here, I trigger my queue list number three, which is on that master, um, to go to queue number one. So whenever I'm uh, triggering a queue here, my queue list in the, uh, will follow so that they have the matching queues. So um, this can be extended in, in many, many ways. So you can even add, like, if you have a lot of conventional stuff, you might do chases or even not also for moving lights and all. So for everything basically which needs um, a fader is then there or the intensity is on a fader. Um, and I'd only store intensity values there. These cues, as you can also see, are always um, um, set to HTTP so that I don't have to prep press play, so I can be sure whenever the console starts and I put that fader up, there's something coming out. Um, in my show file here, in that example I did, um, it's very bas basic and easy. Um, there we have just the wash and spots and I put some X4 bars on the floor. I did basically the same there. I have, when I turn them off, you can see them. Um, I have an odd all and uh, wash all, um, to those two groups for them. Uh, and I link them in together in the same way I did. So can control this, the cells um, there. Um, you ha all have these show files there. So you can follow if you maybe the um, resolution is a little bit bad. Um, and also in all the show files, there's a capture uh, in the download a capture um, presentation file, which runs without any dongle or any license. Um, for PC and Mac, so you can uh, use that on your own computers as well. Um, so that's keep in mind only have HTTP stuff or scaling stuff um, on faders so that we can easily have access uh, to them um, and try to have other stuff um, layout in other options like on the command keys or in on the touch screen. Um, Next thing is what you already see here, um, and then we will. I will show you how I built this stuff. Um, there's actually also a video Leggy did in the uh, Hog4 uh, user group um, where he explained that on a step-by-step -step base um, how to build such a color picker because we can make it like in the old-fashioned way and then s select my group here, uh, select that color, and record it here into a scene and so on and go do that for um, each group. But that takes a lot of time. Um, what we also can do, what is very nice here in on the hawk is we, as we have a very, very powerful syntax, which is um, also every trainer is um, like trying to program it or nail it in your head because it's really important and very, very useful. It's like that we have a source first, we have a mask which we can apply to that source. Third, we have the action, so that's what's happening with that selection 
masked uh, there and then an option to that action and um, the destination where we're going to store it. So where's that useful in the scene directory stuff? As you see here, I created scenes for my, um, I have a fixture group here, which is called all fixtures. Um, so what I did first is I selected that all fixture group um, and built those scenes um, with these palettes here. So, um, oops, uh, so that's what I did. Um, and now I first delete the uh, those scenes here. So example, my, my spot scenes, let's delete those. Uh, let's see. 11 through 27. Hello. Yes. If you don't wonder why you can't see the pop up, it's uh, on my uh, extra screen. So, we, uh, how we can use that and rebuild that um, with that syntax. So, as we did those groups here, uh, we can very easy create that um, those scenes here with the syntax. So my source here in that kind is my scene one through seven. So I just select those scene, scene one through seven. My mask in that next step is uh, my spot. So I can either way select it from the group directory. So I could select my um, all solar frame group here, or um, if you do that, remember that you have guards turned on. Um, otherwise, you will directly select that group and don't just put the, the group in the command line, or you could also go directly fully command line and say uh, from the um, kind buttons and the selection buttons here, group 11. That would be my mask, which I apply to that scene one through seven. Then my command in that case is copy. Um, as I don't need any um, filter on that at the moment, I just um, select my destination. And then my destination in that case would be my scene 11. Two, and that's now scene 11. Enter. And now you see, I have created with one command line commander, command um, seven copies of this all um, color uh, scenes here. When I open up one of those um, color scenes here, for example, the white one, you can see it's only my solar frames inside um, because I took these, uh, this. Um, scene here, put the filter on it, the mask on it, which the mask was the spot back, and then I copy it here. So with that method, you're very, very fast. So this is my spot and selection now. I do the same thing for my um, for my washes. And so that would be the same again. It would be scene one through seven. Then I go my uh, wash bag, for example, which is here. No, sorry, that's the scenes. <laughs> Scene one through seven. Then I take uh, all my solar picks. As you see, I turn guard, guard on. I can select it from here and I copy it here. So I have the same copy here now of those um, from this all directory. If we look inside those now, if I open one of those up, you can see it's just um, copied for all my solar picks here for all my washes. And so this is very, very fast when you want to create those color, um, a color picker like that. Um, to name it, as you also see, I only need to do the, the um, color coding ones to name all those. I just select them, press the set key, and tell them these are my spots. And I do the same thing here on those, select all of them, and select those for my washes. Um, this can go now to every hierarchy level as you want to do that, because 
uh, it all just depends on how many t different types of uh, feature types you have or how structured you want to lay out that whole thing. Um, the other thing, uh, what you can do now is um, you can do the whole thing as well, like for gobos, for any prism stuff, or you can do the same thing for positions. So the syntax in always is always the same, just create it once for all and then apply a mask and copy it over there. Um, the good thing about scenes in, um, oh, let's wait, do it other. Uh, are there any questions already about that, how to do that? So, uh, no, I won't, uh, don't want to make these receipt on other go. I will do explain it later on how I will do that. Um, and anyway, like Leggy already said, they will be released anyway because uh, we're stumping them. Um, so if you if you play back one scene here, as you see, it's now started. And if I play back that scene, this scene will be stumped. So they will be overwritten anyway. So you don't need uh, actually um, a release on other go for those scenes. Um, all right. So the good thing about the scenes is um, that we can. Um, these scenes can e easily alter in timing. So um, when we change to the spreadsheet view of those scenes directory here, um, you see those scenes as these scenes only have one queue, uh, we can easily alter the, the, the fade time and the delay time of those queues. Um, as you don't have only one destination where this timing needs to be um changed or added so very easy when you look at that for example if i want to change the spots timing um the, so the fade time for these spots i could select like scene 11 through 17 time which is a fade time five and there you go so we have now a fade time of five seconds um this stuff will is really helpful in that case because we can really um, we can record these keystrokes in a macro. So and that's basically what I did. So when I open up my macro directory, which is here, you see I've done um, four macros, which is a color time zero, color time one, color time four, color time um, two, four, and four. When we have a look at these, uh, let's open up one. As you see, it's just like we clear the command line first. We have uh, a key press scene one through 37, which is our, which are my, let's move that over here so we can see it, uh, which are, these are my color scenes here. And I changed all these times to zero enter. And that's it. So you basically also need to record that macro once and then copy it over, edit it, and then you have the color time one, color time two, color time four, and so on, just by altering um, the value here. If you press set, you can select a new value here and you're done. Um, also there, one good uh, or one hint, if you want to do that, um, and if you want to record that, because it's a bit hard to add steps in between. Uh, I always record scenes of these numbers here with a three digit. So uh, if I um, even if I start with recording scene one through 70, uh, I start I make myself a basic macro, which was my macro 51 down here, um, where I recorded scene uh, 001 through 037, because when we come later down here, as you see for my um, for my positions scenes here, um, I'm already in the 100s, so I have need uh, three digits to do that. So that's why I always make myself like a, uh, here we go. This macro here 
with uh, three digits and use that as a base so that I can have easily edit these or sometimes I also also tend to uh, add some empty queues, key presses like enter or something like that, because I, I always can alter those key presses, whatever key is pressed later on. Um, so what I did then, I created this color time here, these four macros, and I just triggered then these macros here via these scenes. So this scene here is basically just an empty scene which then triggers um, these macros. So uh, color time zero triggers via DK, DK1, GTK1, this macro. Um, but, uh, so, sorry. Uh, but what we have is like uh, when we have that going on, um, you don't, if you record just an empty scene, you can do that. As you see, when I record that scene, nothing is happening it's triggered but we don't get any feedback where we are at the moment so there's a little trick about that i know leggy is doing it exactly the same um, um we i always used like in all so in other scenario sometimes dummy fixtures are very helpful um so what i did if you go to the patch and have a look there so uh, let's go to setup and we go to our patch. You see, I created myself a dummy fixture. This dummy fixture is nothing than a, just a intensity channel, like a normal dimmer channel. Um, but I just named it dummy, that I had have a little bit more control. I actually patched it to an unused universe, um, and I named it. So you can already see I have a dummy fixture for my color time, which this is here. I have it for my spot times. If I want to have like a um, little bit more structure in that, if I want to have like a spot time different or a color bump trigger, we will come to all that um, in a little bit. So when we created that, what's the advantage of that? So as these scenes, um, when I don't store any value in it for an empty scene, if I open that scene, you see there's nothing inside. We can still trigger the macro, but what I did here in these color time um, scenes, it's actually just recorded my um, color time picture in it as 100%. So when I trigger that cue list here, um, I get that feedback from the console. So um, when I change the timing here, because this cue list is fully stomping that cue list, I get that feedback of the timing, what is actually um, applied to those um, color scenes up here. So with that method, I can uh, work. And this is also something which I also then do for those spots and washes. Um, as we rebuild, uh, as I said, just rebuild those. Um, for example, if I, when I go, um, when I trigger uh, an all queue list, um, and I want to have like also that feedback here, um, where I am right now, I could do the same thing and also store dummy queue lists inside here. Um, so that I know which queue this is actually running because there are several methods how I can override and how, how I can stump that queue list. Um, so as you can see, because I um, this queue list, the all queue list has been fully overwritten, it gets gray. Um, and with the other method, if I if I store um, um, a dummy channel inside here as well, I could leave that here back in the background. So then, I, when I release colors here, um, I can still go see where they will go. Um, yeah. So um, with the same method, like I said, I created also um, a layout for positions here. Um, I have the same um, macro style setup for my positions um, to change the fade time of the positions. Um, I also store um, then as the next thing here is I store my palettes, uh, not, my, not my palettes, my effects uh, without a base. So where does this help? So 
Um, as you see, we could also have the, um, when we come to the positions uh, and we work with, um, with, uh, with defects in that time, um, we would have an op, uh, uh, the, the console works in a way that I could apply um, different uh, base values to the effect. So that's why I only store when we open up that effect. Uh, like for uh, that pan here, I only store um, the effect and don't have any base value. So there are several options how I can work with that. Um, one option is, or one thing is, I can put my spot bags into position. Me to bring them up just a second so you can see them. So well, these are my spots in the background, and I have them now just here as a straight off or as a fan, whatever. And now I can apply an effect directly from that position. So now I have that little cross uh, position and I applied a pan effect and now the effect is uh, working on that position. position. Um, so how to go out from that moving thing? So as we know, um, to stop an effect or to stop an effect, we just need to apply a new position. So when I apply, reapply a position here, um, the effect stops. Um, Sometimes people don't want to do that. So uh, we have an option if you go into the options of a scene. Um, we have an option here which is called pilot effects. Uh, I just do it now for only the position spot back cross so that you can see the difference. As you see, I directly applied it. Um, the effect starts running again. And now, um, may I start from that position? That's set cross. I apply um, a spot pen. And now, when I apply that uh, other position, okay, we don't see that much different. Let's do it from from the straight, and we do it with a circle. So. We have a circle running from that straight position. And if I now apply that um, this scene here with that cross position, you see the fixtures will move to the new position while the effect is still running. Um, in that case, to stop the effect, I would make myself a scene, the same thing here, uh, which is a spot effect release scene, which is basically also then just an empty scene with a dummy fixture inside, which then just releases these four scenes here. And as I also see, empty scene, it has a dummy fixture inside. Um, when I open that up, you see that it has a dummy fixture uh, 9010 inside, so that I can see, and these dummy fixtures are stored in all those five scenes. So as soon as I start this one, this will is going to be released and I see which effect is running and I can see that there's no effect running. Um, this is just a matter of taste. You know, I, um, I tend to do it uh, in a way not with the uh, pilot effect option turned on because with that I can, I save my little, little time a little bit with the, um, I don't need the spot effects turned on and off this is but this is something which is um like I said a matter of taste and um you really can decide on your own how you want to do that just want to look if there are any questions hey mark there is a question um yes. what was the purpose of the dummy channel again and do you build that uh, into purpose, every one yeah. of the scenes yeah and the purpose of the dummy channel is when you look at that dummy channel here, I, we start that scene here, the scene 48, which is an empty one. I can still trigger a macro there. So if I go to that one, um, to my scene 48, I can still trigger macro here. Um, let's say I want, um, my macro should be um, my macro number one. Um, to make the color time zero. Oops. 
So I make my color time four. Um, and I trigger that macro now. You see my color time went to zero, but I have no visual feedback on which time I actually applied because I can trigger that macro, but I don't know which button I press. Or maybe I was working on another queue or whatever. Someone distracted me and I said, oh shit, what is the delay? What is the color fade time at the moment? Um, when I then store uh, that dummy channel into here, I get that visual feedback from the control uh, from the console here um, because when I open up this scene here, you see I've stored that dummy channel inside here. So, and as this dummy channel is nowhere else stored in just in those four color time scenes, um, these scenes are overriding each other and stumping each other and giving me then the visual feedback which of those scenes had been triggered. So now it's color time four. We have the blue bar down here. Now we have a color time uh, four. Uh, now we have a color time one. And this is re represented um, by uh, the blue bar here. I hope this is uh, answered now. Any other questions? Double checking real quick. Yeah, Leggy answered most of the stuff. Uh, what is in my stop EFX? Yeah, okay, good question. And my stop FX is just, um, yeah, where is it? It's just the release macro here. So it just releases 107, uh, scene 107 through 110. So that's basically just releasing those um, four scenes. So this is the option if you are if you want to go with the pilot effect option, so that you can stop the effect from there. So it's basically nothing else. It's also just empty, and it also only have if we look inside there. Um, we only have also a dummy fixture, and this dummy fixture is stored as well in those 107, 108, 109, or 110. So that if I press that, I know which effect is running. It will work from for um, for all the others because these are stumping uh, actually each other. But um, for so that I can be sure that I can see that also uh, the release is triggered. Um, uh, I also stored in those dummy channels. It just gives you a bit more clear um, back, um, feedback of what is actually happening on the console at the moment. Anything else? Mark, why are those scenes 101, 102, and 104 not releasing when you're choosing other uh, around that same row again? What? Those scenes, one the spot back scenes. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like they're releasing out. Like if they still have visual feedback. They. What? Let me check the question. Um, Is it? It's from Matt Gaminsky. He says yeah. that your scenes for positions aren't releasing other scenes. Matt, where is it? Um, it's a little bit further up. Is it down there? Further down? Why isn't stomping occurring when he when you're activating other scenes? Ah, uh, why those scenes are not stomped? Um, that's depending. Um, they are bec because these scenes are set to persist on override. This is just another option how you can keep your scenes in the background. Um, sorry, I forgot to tell that. So you can keep your scenes in the background active um, to be safe that you never have um, anything released accidentally or nothing happening on stage. You can do that with persist on override. Um, which I did here. You could do that with the scenes directory here as well, but then it will look like that after a while a little, little bit messy, um, which I think when everything is gray. Um, that's why I tend to do it with the dummies, which gives me more and clearer visual feedback in that kind, because then I only have the blue bars there, which shows me which scene is active. And the other ones then will be stumped and not be active anyway. But it still they uh, can be 
kept in the background active because they are not will not be fully stumped because of that dummy channel which is stored into that uh, scene or queue list. Okay, so um, this is basically the first layout I where we started um, with all doing that. Um, what is also something very nice and useful uh, when it comes to busking, because sometimes you have um, stuff laid, not laid out or need to have find your way around, sneak inside and out of a, of a situation. What I t always find, it's not nothing big to demonstrate now, it's just to mention, is um, don't forget about pig blind. No matter if you are in the blind state or in the, um, or go into a blind state. Um, if I have um, pig blind active, or if you do it with pig blind, it will always respect the timing which you have set in the uh, in the programmer. So no matter if you have fade changes turned on or off, you can sneak in and out of a queue of the programmer if you have um, have it active. So if it needs to be done. Um, so um, that's really a helpful thing as well if you have, um, uh, if you use pick line to sneak it in and out of a situation um, where you don't want to just have it bumped out. Um, the other thing is, um, as we also, also, our software team in Austin is also working a lot of stuff and requests, um, this whole layout here is not just um, that's how I did it in the old days, but now, um, as we have uh, our plots, um, to we, we had a lot of new options to our plots, we can also work this whole thing out with plots. So, um, what I did here is um, I made just plots are not just useful for pixel mapping. Um, one good thing is about plots is that um, when you use plots and make that a little bit bigger, so it's better to see for you. Um, so with plots, you can also select fixtures very easily. Um, so that's quite good for also complex fixture selection during programming. Um, so you can drag a box over it uh, to select fixtures. Um, uh, I don't see my program panel, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that was a bit too big. But you can follow on your own show file anyway. So uh, what is also nice if you select then features, but you also might know that you can all very easy create complex fixture selections, so from left to right or whatever. Um, without the need to type. So this is also then useful when you program um, your shows here. So this is one thing I always lay out also when I have the time to do. But um, this is even like you see, we as we can now add groups here and graphics and all that stuff for graphical representation, we can also use that then for scenes and for selection. So all the stuff I did here in my scenes windows, I can also do that in the plot and get more visual feedback, can create it in a nicer way, uh, laid out a little bit more graphical so that I'm not limited to just those um, grid layout. I can, uh, like the directories, I can lay it out more in a graphical way I used to have. I can make those borders around so that it can see, okay, this is my color time, this is my position time. Um, yeah, just make it a little bit more um, nice and easy to select your stuff in a, in a busking situation. And there, the your own imagination is just to limit what you can do. Um, I've seen a lot of nice setups. Also, uh, Scott Barnes did some very nice setups there. So. Um, I'm a bit too lazy mostly to do uh, to do it because uh, I'm the old fashioned guy. When I when I program those scenes anyway, I, I'm just laid out directly in a way I can use it. But um, as the moment as we have a lot of spare time, so you might have uh, fun with creating your um, console layout in that way and create what is on the EOS like a magic sheet or a, what is it called an MA. Um, 
the layout view. So this is also basically now possible here uh, in Hawk OS. So that's another way of doing it. Um, what I also do um, quite often, or what we always need, um, oh, what I totally forgot, sorry for that, um, with those scenes, um, this is just one option of, um, of controlling the fade time of our scene so that I can do it. But as I mentioned before, um, um, that timing and stuff like that is also always possible to be done on a, or can be put on a fader. Let's see if I have the um, playback bar ready. Yes. Mm. So normally, so here's what I do also. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any hardware connected to, to my PC. Um, what is very useful in situations like that is um, that you can, um, that you can have um, the docking setup. So um, I have on my main playback bar here, um, I have my main setup with all the uh, intensities laid out. And on my next playback bar, uh, I have laid out some stuff which I can either way, for example, my smoke and my wind machines, which I can control by press and holding the choose button. And then the last encoder, as you can see on the right hand, on the right edge of the screen, uh, will turn to um, the encoders where I can change my effect size, effect rate, and stuff like that. There's also an option to change um, effect um, sizes, effect speeds without the need to make a batch. Um, and I also can change for my smoke and wind machine, which I don't need too much on a fader, um, uh, but I still want to control the intensity that I can do then just by press and holding the choose button and then turn the last encoder. This will always be my intensity encoder. And this also works um, from the QList directory. So when you open up a QList directory or for a scene directory, I can do exactly the same thing here, if I press and hold the queue list here, this will do exactly the same thing. So do, you don't need to actually um, need to put uh, some stuff on a fader to control uh, the, the intensity. Uh, this also works for groups. So if you want to have like an inhibitor, like a group master, you can do exactly the same thing there. You also don't need to put it on a, on a fader. You can just press and hold it here. Uh, and as you see, uh, now my all solar frames become, um, I can inhibit them via turning the encoder. Uh, so that's about that. Um, so, but back to the timing um, stuff. Um, as you see, I took just all those scenes, this spot time, um, my scene 101, uh, 102, 103, 104, 111, 112, 113, 114. These are my spot positions here um, for my back and my front truss. So what I can do now is um, if I take, uh, if I, let's move that uh, to a fader first so you can see the difference. Uh, give me a second. Just which is for five. So now we have that on the fader here, as you can see, and then I can change the um, to playback rate so that it becomes a scalar. And now if I go to, um, as you see, we have now a position time setup of two seconds. I used my same style macro what I used before, uh, select a new position, but I could also scale these positions, these position timing via the master, via, via that master which is there. So when I bring the master up, the position time gets faster. And when I bring it down, the fade time. is lower. So that's also an option how I can control the fade time 
um, of my scenes um, when I create a batch for those scenes. To create that batch, um, I just select all of the scenes. Um, syntax for that is like with all other uh, batch creation, I just select my scenes. Let's create that one scene. Oops. 101 through 104, for example, and I move it here. And now that created that batch for scene 101 through 107. And then I only need to select one of the five master decryptor set, which in that case is the playback rate for that scene. I select that here. And if I now go into the settings of that scene in my options and go to playback rate, I can set the upper and lower bounds um, if I want to have doubled half, whatever. So um, yeah, like you do with scenes and uh, Lipis batches anyway. Um, one other thing, what we always, or is there any questions about that before? Let's see. Yeah, Leggy answered that already. It's just a demo show. I'm, I'm, I'm not a much position guy anyway. <laughs> I tend to work with five to eight positions and that's it. And then, um, yeah find your way around with those so um but yeah it's just for demos here that it's uh, not fully laid out um yeah no other questions quite good so one thing um we always love to do and what we have when we are busk um uh, when we're busking is we have uh, color bumps um so i made my typical color bump list this is something here um so we have a base color which is selected here in the background which is uh yellow and i have a uh, bump color which i can select here and i have that queue list which runs through that by um on because i put the queue list on that button here so how we can do that so um as you can see i also created a bumps two step bump three step bump four step scene and also release bump um, scene. Um, what that list is basically is um, just a long queue list with queue only queues inside it. And I show you how to create that or how I did that. Um, as you also have it in your um, in your show file. So um, where's my bump queue list? List six is it? Yeah. Um, sometimes I forgot to label it, but uh, let's do that first. <laughs> Bump. So, um, and let's move that list so that we can see what we're doing. We're moving it to that fader here. So this queue list is basically um, a queue list with um, a setup queue always for the for the uh, which is an empty queue. Um, then a two-step bump, which is just an odd even, a three-step bump, which is like uh, one third, the second third, and the last third, the same for quarters of a selection. To do to program that it's quite easy. You can um, always use the uh, group next selection if we Let's do it first. Um, Noah and Megan explained that in one of their last scenarios quite nicely um, in the last of webinars. So if we select all solar frames and highlight, oops, not all solar, I want just the back ones, my back truss. And then we, if we go to segments and have like a segment of four, for example, and then we go to uh, press and hold down group next and then you see the selection here in segments and budding is um, respected so i can very easily create all these selections and select those fixtures for programming these um these queue lists um on a um on the three step i would select uh, segments of three and a four step, four step on a segments of four and so on um yeah but back to my queue list 
So this cube is basically what it does. Uh, it just releases this scene 70. My scene 70, as we see in C, is my release bump cue list. So that I can, that I, this visual feedback is then, now I know I don't have any bump cue list active. So if I, as soon as I have one of those, it releases that, that I don't have any feedback there. Um, also there inside we have um, done with the dummy queue um, like before. Um, these queues are also, like said, uh, queue only. Um, and with those queue lists, I only program it once. I do it for the two step, three step and four step. And then I can bump through that list with that here. So, and by these macros, with these macros here, I just tell the console to jump into these queue lists, into the special queue of that queue list. To make life easy for me and to remember during programming, I said, okay, my two step is my queue number, queue number 20, my three step 30, and my four step uh, bump is my queue list 40. Um, when looking at the queue list, um, we see these queues number 20, 30, and 40 are just uh, empty queues, and these are the setup queues. So I can prepare um, without actually executing my bumps. So let's go to my scenes. Maybe, for example, put everything in magenta. And now I select I want white color bumps on my next go and it should be a four step. So I selected that and as soon as I hit then uh, my go here, this color bump will be executed. So, um, and to make what, and actually it's just one list. So how is the color changing done? The color changing for that bump queue list here, so that because I'm lazy, I only want to program that list once. I could copy it and then make one list for um, for cyan, one list for magenta, and so on. But still, this would be like then also use for each color one of those um, comment keys here. Um, and I always want my bump key to be the same key. Um, so I also made myself again a macro. And this macro um, is using, or when I look, let's look at that queue list first. Um, when we uh, look at that list um, and we view that queue here, and we look at the palettes, you see this queue list is stored with my bump color um, preset. Um, so what I and when we look at my color directory here, I have a bump color here. So what I actually just do is I created myself a macro which does nothing else than just changing um, the value inside that bump color. So when we look at that bump color, when we open up that palette here, you see. Um, I saw that as a per picture um, palette anyway. That's one of the things I always tend to do um, anyway for busking. I will talk about that in a minute. Um, so, and there you see uh, my solar frames had act have actually uh, the zero value at the moment. So they are white. That's the white bump color for them because I selected before the white. Um, so what does this macro do? Uh, when we have a look at that macro, um, there we go. So we have, I created these seven macros. Um, let's open one and have a look at that. So first what it does, it makes, um, there are several options to do that. Leggy also made a nice video for that. And he did a little bit different than I do, because what he was doing, it's also quite nice and possible. You, <coughs> sorry, you could just use like um, record replace um, or merge in a, in a queue list um, for to to do that. What I do is um, because I use that macro color, 
um, or that that bump color for um, because I always make myself a bump cue list for washes and a bump cue list for spots. And so I can use different colors from the same um, color palette. And that's why um, I use this method here is I make it blind, the program a blind. What it actually then happens, I recall that group. So in that case, group 15, which is my back trust group, put it into that color and merge. Um, and as a soft key low right is um, in hot PC, the um, perfecter um, into color 40, which is my, um, my bump color. Um, confirm it by enter, press clear, and do the blind again, um, that I'm not blind anymore. So when I run that macro, um, it actually changes the um, this bump color preset. So as you see, we're running that bump color at the moment uh, with that white. And if I run that macro here, let's see, make it to red. You see it runs once and also directly, even when I'm still running that cue list, um, the color uh, is changed. So with that method, it's really easy to make that bump cue list. Um, this bump cue list can be even longer, you know, you can make your color bumps first, then you can make um, whatever, global bumps, um, iris bumps. So it's all that you always have just one button, avail button available for uh, for your bumps. Um, yeah, so there you're also your imagination is the limit and not um, what I'm telling here. So um, it's only up to what you need. Um, what I thought when I'm looking at those effects rate and effect size stuff here, I just forgot one thing to add before. Um, for sure, when we have those effects running here, um, they are stored at a fixed rate. Um, I could change that rate. So let's move that out a little bit. Uh, when I press and hold that key, so you can do it with the encoders to change the effect rise and the effect size, but you always can also for sure um, put the same um, scenes again also on a fader. So that's what I did here so that we have like um, effect rates for my spots for and for my washes. I all, then the same method is exactly the same. You press and hold the key, change the um, uh, master descriptor set to be effect rate. And for this one, I changed it to be effect size. So I can change, can play back the, this effect and uh, can control the, uh, the speed and the size for um, the effect running from here uh, with the fader. Um, all right, let's have a look of my. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, the, the bump color thing is this. What time do we have? No. All right. Um, so, so that's basically how I lay out my stuff here. Um, in general, there are some stuff which I would like to tell you when you uh, program your busking setup, but because mostly um, this busking server is either like done as a start joke or also um, when you travel and only have like a floor kit with you and have to go to festivals and only have limited um, setup times. Um, I have some channel hints or, or let's wait to do different before I go on with that. Let's have a look if there are any questions so far. Um, ah, yeah, good point, Roland mentioned. Um, fate changes. Um, fate changes if you sometimes you really, I tend to do not to do busking in the programmer. There are a lot of people doing it because it's a, a more easy way or a lazy way because why should I need to program uh, my colors doubled and three times and four times in my uh, programs and my, in my positions if I already have them in a programmer? But as you see with the syntax I did, it's not that much longer to create a matrix like that. But if you want to do that in the, uh, in the programmer, um, there's also a nice way uh, to enable and disable um, fade changes 
um, because you can put it on, on one of the drag ball buttons. Um, and as um, even if if, con uh, if your console doesn't have a drag ball button, the for example Kensington Magic Mouse has these four buttons, and you can put them on there and use them in exactly the same way, like on a on a Hawk four on a full board. And one of those button options is exactly to make fade changes. Uh, turn on and off, and this is also sometimes useful for busking scenarios. Uh, what else do we have there? Uh, One of the things I've seen programmers do is also just have two different views of the programmer. One with yeah. fade changes on, one with fade changes off. And then they have those views on their command keys to toggle really quickly between. Yeah, also, um, if I have a master I show, I agree with Mark on that one. Though I definitely think the program is better, definitely best left to programming, not playback. So quick to set up yourself some proper playback and keep your program clear for emergencies, such as unpredictable events and resetting fixtures, etc. And the clues in the yeah. title for the programmer. <laughs> I also agree with that completely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Leggy also. Uh, there was one question: Would the BAM macro work with color wheels and not just for LED? Uh, yes, it would also work if, for any color param parameter because you you actually just use here what it does. It just takes the information from these fixtures. I select those fixtures and apply that color palette. And this color palette is then merged into this bump color palette. So it doesn't matter if it's a slotted value or if it's a color mixed value or even a combination of both. It's just taking this information and um, copies it uh, and merges it into the bump color. You can directly take that method and do it the same thing for uh, iris bumps or whatever, an iris presets to build an uh, iris cue list or so. So um, this this show file is not tend to be uh, a perfect busking show file. It's just uh, an example and showing method how you can create a busking layout. There's another question from Kerry. Um, if I have a master show file and just change fixture types from show to show, um, this is something what what I really want to talk right now is um, I. Um, I have kind of a master show file when it comes to busking or when it comes to uh, touring situations. I don't have a real busking uh, or master show file I use for um, as a general startup show um, because all my shows are so different and um, those 10 to 12 color presets are fast done. I need when we're broken the show, also the positions um, and with uh, when you take too much old information with you all the time, sometimes also your database gets uh, clunky or you take just information with you, which you actually don't need. But if I want to have like a busking show file, when I know I have need to uh, prepare a festival um, situation, for example, yes, then I have a show file, which I use and reuse because festival situations are always the same you have a front you have several trusses uh front mid back and floor kit um it's just most of the times you have just different types of fixtures and then i clone them and uh, replicate them and that's is something which i want to add now because it's also on my little cheat sheet um so what i tend to do is when it comes to storing your pallets um, to be safe that cloning and um, and uh, replicating is working in a proper way is I tend to uh, store all my palettes directly as a fixture palette because then it doesn't matter if you change your fixture type and lose any information uh, when you change all those fixtures or um, add in some informations or so like that and uh, or have another revision sometimes of features or another mode or something like that it's always then stored based on the um, on the fixture number and so it's easier to clone and replicate and change type um, that's one ex one thing i do um, we're facing more and more the situations where we have all those multi-cell fixtures which um are like good and bad at the same time they give us a lot of creativity 
I personally hate it in festival situations because I most of the time don't have the time to program a 20 minute or 30 minute changeover, all the fancy stuff I could do. Then I prefer just a regular LED watch light mode and go for it. Um, but even for those cases, if I prepare a show file or have we have stuff like um, the X4 bars or something like that, um, I let's I'm go into the patch here. Um, oops, uh, set up. When we go into the patch here, as you see, uh, what we can do here at the moment, those fixtures. Um, those uh, I, I took the compound fixture and um, use them as a compound. But um, what we also could do is uh, we could take those, um, and that's what I did or what I always do when I'm done with programming. Uh, because in the beginning, it's easier for patching my stuff when I lay out my show file first time. Um, but then I select those fixtures. And uh, 501 through, I select them and I use the um, compound explode mode here. Um, this doesn't harm your show file in any way. Um, it just takes the, um, um, the, the compound fixture here, which is basically just uh, a predefined set of uh, a master and some, some cells and dotted user numbers and breaks it into pieces as a warning yes i will do so and now as you see the console splits those up into its single parts so now we have so for example for those x4 bar single picks i have those um 20 cells uh here and i have that master fixture here and now it's very easy for me to clone those elements so um, I can add another master, for example, um, I broke them with, um, with single picks, uh, with X4 four bar 20 single picks, and now the vendor where he supplied um, uh, X4 bar 10s. So I have the double amount of um, masters, so I, in, in that case I only need to um, clone those um, or replicate those uh, 501 through 14 masters, uh, um, patch them to the matching address and uh, use my other cells here um, in the same way. I just can renumber them and have directly um, cloned um, from 20s to 10s. Um, works exactly the same way as uh, other round uh, if I go from 10s to 20s as well, because then I just take the master from the first 10, clone it to the first 20, uh, and just take the cells and clone them there. Uh, it just doesn't make uh, any difference um, in my selection tools, because the whole dotted user selection works exactly the same way, no matter if I created those dotted features on my own. I, I talked about that, or uh, Scott Barnes talked about that in the pixel mapping. Uh, sessions we did for those German speakers, uh, you find that in the study hall as well. Um, they explained a bit how to how you can create uh, those dotted user numbers from uh, without any uh, predefined um, compound features. So this is also one thing I do um, there, and um, uh, also when it comes to cloning, always. Uh, think about your selection order. This is something very useful when you have, for example, laid, laid out a, a truss which has uh, maybe just in your original programming uh, eight features and you want to uh, replicate them now um, so um, that you have like 16 features. You can replicate them in a way that you maybe have them selected one through eight and then your number um, and then, then you renumber your new number nine as 16 so that the outer fixtures are symmetrical or you just might um, replicate in, in sections of four so that you get directly more uh, of a um, spreaded layout so this is always also a good thing what you need to think about them before you um, start cloning your fixtures and replicating your fixtures. 
um, that the selection order and the way you do it is also important and it's really helpful. Um, then also um, do the replication before you change the type. Um, that I find always easier because then you can be sure that all the programming is uh, taken over there with all the data. And I always, when you then clean up your programming, I always tend to um, save uh, or keep one of the um, original fixtures. Um, I kick sometimes out all the other fixtures. Um, I um, I keep sometimes one of the original fixtures that I can be sure if I accidentally store, store some values as a on a per um, type base that these values can't get lost and I can look them up later on. Or if I want to have clone back or change back to that type again, that these original fixtures are there. So um, let's have a look if there are any questions about that. There's a, there's a couple of caveats with that one though, I'd have said. If you're always going to replicate before you change type, that means any plot views you may have set up for fixture selection are not going to work because you're using a new set of fixtures, not the original set of fixtures. Uh, yeah, so be yeah. careful when you're doing this. You may, you're obviously going to have to update groups and stuff as well. So there's, you know, there's two schools of thought on that. Sometimes I actually find maybe you replicate your original set of fixtures and then leave the replicated fixtures in the background and change yeah, time yeah. on the originals. So that means everything is going to transpose to the new set of active fixtures. Yeah, that's also yeah, a valid point, Johnny. Uh, like, yeah, that's also very it it's it, it there there's no wrong or right there in that scenario because there yeah, it always depends on the situation. When you do a lot of stuff with pixel mapping, for example, um it's it's the the method Leggy described is better to do it that way because then you can be sure all your fixtures are laid out there uh, proper in the in the pixel map. Uh, what else, Leggy? You answered everything already. Very nice. <laughs> um, so let's see how much. Yes, yeah, ten past. Um, I'm almost through with, with all the stuff, how I lay out myself. Um, I just want to add something which popped up during my, um, I did not prepare it here, but which popped up through um, my pixel mapping um, uh, webinar I did some days ago in German and also Scott Barnes had it there. Um, what is very nice if you work also with pixel mapping layouts in in busking situations or in festival situations um, is that um, you can very easily uh, extend those pixel mapping to um, to the size of your um, setup. So um, programming complex chases, chases and or color chases and stuff like that can be done very easy with two layers um, which um, with the same content on it with a little bit of offset and stuff like that and movements on there um, and because of the uh, that because of the pixel map is not changed and just a number of features you add to that pixel map is changed you can very easily create and change um, the same look with different type of numbers of fixtures uh, without to think about how to reclone which fixture needs to be cloned to something else or whatever it's just once editing the, the adding um, changing those fixtures and then uh, adjusting them proper in the in one time in the plot layout and then all stuff based on that plot uh will directly uh, match the programming so don't need to actually check each of the cues because you can be sure once the plot is laid out proper um and um, the fixtures are laid out there uh in the right uh, order it will work uh fine yeah so um that's basically it from me from my side uh, maybe leggy you, you want to add something or megan or we have some more questions I think it's important to stress what you said yeah. earlier. This is just a set of tools you're giving people here. You haven't shown people a full busking yes. show. Yeah. There's it's, different it's, ways of yes. doing things. But for example, the way you set up the color palettes using um, dummy fixtures and not using persistent override, you could also do that with your position scenes. 
the way you do exactly. the position of word is just a different way of achieving a similar thing, which is why you're getting different results with the feedback on, on showing exactly. screen. And that's why that's why I show that's why it's also here when we look at that, that screen to show you the difference between those different feedbacks here. This feedback is done with the with the dummy fixtures here, and this feedback is done here with persistent override. And it's just a matter of taste if you prefer that one with a lot of gray bars down there, um, or if you prefer a little bit. I prefer that one with the dummy fixtures because it's a little bit cleaner and more. Um, yeah, clean and more um, visible directly which queue is running at the moment um, compared to the persistent override thing. But there's no wrong or right as, as, as long as it works for you. There's as many ways to set up a bus page as there are people to operate them. You know, everybody's will be slightly different in one way or another. Uh, one other thing, Mark, we can talk about What, sorry, T our time only pellets, yes. Um, yeah, we could do time out. Um, the good thing we right have, have right now, um, uh, this stuff I did not program yet. I'm not, did not prepare. Um, when we, because we have, let's close that one here. Oops, sorry. Oops, go back to my scenes view here. Um, we have, um, we can store timing as well as a, a time only palette. And reuse that as well in a in a in a scene trigger way here. So when I store um, as I um, start the, um, the the palettes here, um, these are not used with palettes. So this is just one value inside here. This is just recalling. Um, let's open that up. Thanks for reminding me, Leggy. Um, this is just oops, not that one I wanted. This one. So this is just recording that macro here, which is um, which is basically doing. Uh, that one I want to open. Which is just basically saying, okay, I want scene one through seventy four time zero enter. Um, and now. Uh, Leggy described that very on a step by step base in, in your video, uh, which is also in the HOC4 user group. Maybe we can repost that or link that later on um, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, user group again. Is that you can have the same method here. You, we can reuse um, um, color um, time only palettes. So a time only palette is created. By I select some fixtures, um, select a color because there must be actually a base value first. Then I can say um, some complex timing. So, for example, I want a color change um, which goes from uh, the outside to the inside um, with a delay. So I can say my uh, time, my color time, should be. On a step base, so the first time is like a zero second uh, fade, and the next time press gives me my delay time, and I want that, for example, from zero through two through zero. And when we open up the programmer right now, we will see, and when we go to fade, we see we have a fade, fade time of zero seconds, and we have a delay time, which is then, oh, sorry, uh, I have still the segments on, make no segments, and let's do the time. So we have uh, color, time, time, zero through two through zero. So that will, as you see, uh, I selected all. Again, my mistake, let's redo that. I just want the back trust. My back trust should be white so that we can have a, um, a value to store. Um, and now I want the color time to be zero and uh, delay time zero through two through zero. And now you see um, we can enter what you have also have shown, we can enter fade and delay times in the same command line. You don't need to do it like color time zero, color time time zero through two through zero. You can do it in one um, command line command. 
So uh, what, is, what does it give us? We have now for those fixtures selected the fade time from with zero seconds and the delay time from zero through two to, through zero. So a nice symmetrical um, color bump from the outside uh, to the inside. Uh, we can also do try that with a uh, with a pick blind. As you see, this was there. We go. There we have it. We make the uh, we make the program blind again, and to have it running with the uh, timing given. So that's what I want to store. Um, and as we can reuse that with all other color with a set, different set of colors, we could store this color or this timing as a time only palette. So what do I do now? If I press record, and I just mask in the time and store that here, and as you see now, I have stored that as a color. Um, um, as a color um, time only color palette. So in the same way I could um, I did it store before the, the uh, my color bumps uh, in scenes, I could store scenes with these color timings and with the with a bump uh, or a change uh, or a um, uh, whatever color. Um, and when I trigger that scene, this color timing will be applied to that scene. And now if I create several of those scenes, I could, could exactly do the same thing with the color bump here. I could, could merge and replace that one with that. And this, um, when I have that in a scene inside, then I can um, trigger um, the same fade in, fade out stuff um, from those um, from those scenes. And there's a very nice step-by-step -step, um, thing uh, in the hot four um, group done by Leggy, so you can rewatch it there already. Uh, yeah, because we have little time just left. <laughs> What's the advantage of a scene? Uh, you can, yeah, quick edit yeah, that we had. Is there anything else I missed? Yes, it's being recorded for posting. Um, it will be reposted on the um, on the uh, ETC study hall, and it will be also then on the um, on the YouTube channel um, for ETC. Uh, is there anything else, Leggy? Is there anything you want to add? Um, so I think it's command keys, of course. I'm really covered these. Ah, com so oh yeah, yeah, totally forgot about that. Yeah, command keys. Um, yeah, but <laughs> thanks for reminding. Um, what I uh, what I put when we look at our command directory, because actually you see my command my cute my bump queue list here. What I programmed before, um, it's not normally I don't have it here on the queue list. I only have it. Uh, I put it just here on a master to show how it's done. I only have it here on the command key, um, and have it running here. Um, so uh, just there we go. There we see it. So that's my bump cue list here. So this is what I have down here on those keys. Um, this is also very good for colors or everything else where you actually don't need a fader. And to move something there, um, like you know before, is um, we have the command directory. So when if you press and hold the open key, or you also have it, um, I just overwrite the, the view here. You find the commands here, and you just can, uh, what I did here in my show file, I actually just put the bumps here and have that bump cutest set up to be a go. Um, uh, so it will just trigger that. And one other example I have prepared to show what we can also do very nice with that stuff, which is also quite useful, is um, a typical random white um, queue. Um, so when I trigger that, you see this is a typical end of the song thing. Everything is strobing and doing stuff, crazy stuff like that. Um, so this queue 
is just set up um, to be have everything in open wide, have that random um, stroke programmed. But to have that on that flash option here, uh, that it's not uh, that it's directly re releasing when I also lose that button here, is uh, when I'm in my command options here, I go to my spreadsheet view, and I move that random wide queue list here. You find it in my queue list directory. Just open that up. Um, that's my queue list five right there. I, to move that here, I just go like list five move and i can directly hit the button here and then it's there i can do it also with the command directory and what i do i just moved it here now as you can see and the difference of those two queues is it's both time the queue, same queue list but this one is the modified i already did and whenever you move a queue list to a command key the action is set to be go um, so we need to change that. So I select that option here, that option here, and set key, and change that to be flash. There's a little, because I'm working in the um, beta, there's a little bug which has been solved in the latest release. Um, this is an older one. So uh, I go to flash here. You don't see that actually at the moment. Um, so we have set that to flash. And in the queue list option for that uh, random white stroke, um, let's open that one. So when I go to the options here, I have set for that queue list to be the release time of zero seconds um, and to be the fader um, flash at 100% and to be go on flash and release on off. So whenever that button here, that is configured now as a flash button. So it's like a shortcut to the real flash button. So it has exactly the same thing. So whenever I hit that button, it is doing the same thing. If I would flash that thing, um, it's working as a flash key. And if I let it go, it releases this queue list. So I also put um, that I can easily um, Turn off my bumps here. For example, if I'm bumping here through a queue list, if I want to turn that bump off, I also put my release bump scene also down here. So I can um, release that queue list down there. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff you can use on command keys. So everything basically which can also live in a scene, but where you want to really have that haptic feedback and that button press thing with all the flash keys. That's quite useful if you put them on command keys. Um, yeah, what else? Ah, there's also one thing I also tend to do is um, I have, as you see here, I totally forgot about that before, is um, I use sometimes for IPCB faders, a uh, typical thing is like an audience no color um, fader. That's my fader number 10 here. If I bring up the my front lights here, and this is just brings up all the front lights in open white in an audience wash, so I can easily um, go there in the end of the song and have it on an IPCB fader fades it out. I can then rearrange some stuff in the bag, change colors or whatever, and as soon as I lower that fader, I also can say, okay, that's turn down the intensity of those first, whatever, and then uh, move them slowly back to stage. So also with IPCB faders, you can really do nice stuff. And um, also have also stuff like that with the uh, out in the audience um, laid out, even if I do um, a pre-programmed show where I go from queue to queue, because you never know what happens. Maybe the artist wants to talk to the audience and uh, right in the middle have because the string is broken or whatever from the guitar player. So you can light up the audience and can go back into your queue list then later on or jump in another queue and still fade back to that queue um, there. Yeah, so that just it's not like like a full busking show. Like I said, these are just building blocks. The um, 
the scene directory stuff can be done for gobos, for whatever beam looks. Um, I just made ex different examples and I diff showed the different options how you can do that. Um, also, watch please rewatch the the live videos Leggy did on the on the Hawk Four Facebook group, um, which explains again these methods how you can do that and uh, gives you also some other options how you can lay out your uh, busking setup. So we have yeah we're almost done with those 90 minutes so we have some minutes left for q a if there are some more unanswered questions or maybe megan and lay wants to add some stuff which i might have missed um it looks like we did get one do you do strobes for each type of light for a command key yeah i tend to sometimes i also have like a, one of those trope cues which do it for overall but i also have like um one for um one for each group so that i can have like a little bit of strobe stuff more accurate um but um i really have on my command keys and mostly if i have real strobes i have for sure them there and then mostly um, just that um, that overall crazy random open white look for for heavy ends, which is like before the the last hit comes or stuff like that. Um, may, maybe if you if you are more into the EDM stuff, like Leggy did a lot of stuff, you might do it on a per per group base. But I'm more the old school rock and roll guy, and there use it big, <laughs> make it big, and then uh, then you don't actually need your single groups. It's just um, personal taste. It's personal taste. Of what you need for that particular show. You can. I like to speak up. Maybe I'll do floor wash, blown wash, floor spots, flown spots, whatever. Yeah. Or, or um, depends what you want. Again, like I said earlier, different strokes. Every bus page will be. Different. Um, something else I would point out when we're here is command keys. You can also open that command directory on screen and use yeah, it in yeah. the same fashion as that scene directory is being used. The advantage of doing this is it means it will work as a flash button. So you can have an on screen strobe stab, for example, if you want it. That's got the intense information there, which is something you can't do with the scenes. It also means if you have created your bus page, using macros to edit fade times or other other things which are dependent on the scene's position and number within the directory, as soon as you, if you want to reorganize and move those scenes, your macros will no longer work because the references are broken. Are broken. But if you are using the scenes from the command window as your playback surface, you can reorganize the command. The scene numbers that the macros are targeting underneath. But that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit more flexibility there, and of course, that addition of using the flash buttons is really good. And going back to what Mark was saying briefly earlier about using the scene directory or the plot view, the plot view is great. I love the new plot views. I won't hear a word said against them; they're fantastic. But for something like the color picker, you have to ask yourself: Do you really need to do it? And building the color picker in the scene window is very fast, very efficient, uh, and it and very space conscious you know it's neatly arranged and neatly grid. it's got everything you need all the feedback everything is there why bother sticking around the plot view a plot view i think is great for something where you need a visual label of a, a gobo or a position they're really good in there you can set up your visualizer and take screenshots of all your positions and then import them and use them in your plot view so you don't have to think of names for what is this this is this is uh spots crossed version three or whatever just take Photographs or the position of the visualizer, stick them in the plot and you're done. You're running fun house at a festival, but nobody has to decipher your weird naming system. Same with Gobos. You know, Gobos, I know they all have an official name. I can never remember what they are. It's always that breakup one or that spiky one or whatever. So if you can put the photograph of Gobo in, then it's a really useful thing. So think, you don't have to use plot view for everything. Some stuff, some stuff is probably better in the scene window, some stuff's better in the plot, in the plot view. Uh, Matt Greenman asked if is there a way to do uh, re to delay release times. Unfortunately, not. It would be great if you could have that. Megan, please know it and put it on uh, number 
whatever. I think there are a lot of many comments already all read on that and that we could have different release options. Um, no, unfortunately not. We, we, this is um, uh, when I need stuff to be released like that, then I then we can't do it with those scenes stuff with, with the release options. Then we have to work around a little bit with uh, two queues sometimes, or then release that end stuff um, after the um, that you have like a release queue, and then the queue just releases itself at the end. So that, that there are options to work around, but not that comfortable like with what we have with scenes at the moment. Where you, that would be really nice. We, we could have the the same uh, thing from going into a scene the delay time. That it could be like just do it backwards for release or whatever. Uh, yes, I think I've actually logged that myself for yeah. something that I've wanted, actually. Yeah. I think it's logged. Yeah, I'll put a plus one in it in the system. Yeah. <laughs> put, how many people do we have? We have like 68. Put, put plus 68. <laughs> <Okay>. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So we're we're happy. we've done with that ninety minutes. That went on fast. Yeah. yeah so definitely. Uh, I Is hope. One... Can I ask one quick question? Yeah, sure. I'm sure, people want to know about third party stuff. Do y'all do you guys personally use MIDI controllers for your shows, uh, or do y'all just stick with the hardware like wings and consoles? Um, I'm if you know I always order like um, when I'm traveling somewhere um, I always um, order a, a console and a wing but um, if there isn't a, a wing around I also made it work with, uh, with OSC with my iPad which gives a lot of options um, MIDI is also nice to do a lot of stuff because we can trigger a lot of stuff I'm more a fan of OSC because MIDI at the moment is still limited, but this will change. I little sneak preview. <laughs> <laughs> so we um, and um, so OSC is one thing uh, I often tend to use. I also often have like um, the uh, people also using X keys, for example, or any other matrix stuff there. I also have like a stream deck always with me um, with a little Raspberry Pi. Um, which is nice to control also stuff via OSC, so they give me extra buttons. I have that thing anyway in my backpack for controlling media servers and stuff, so if there is hardware missing, there are options I can find my way around. And now with the also with the virtual playback bars and playback wings on screen, um, it's also easy if there's some stuff missing where would have need real faders. I can still find my way around with the virtual wings, but I always prefer one real wing with uh, 10 faders and the rest I can deal with with uh, the, the stuff which the console offers me. I know people, I know a lot of people also have like tons of MIDI controllers there. I also have them here to try out and maybe it's just because I did not think about it, but um, for the shows I do, I normally find my way around with the stuff I have there, and uh, I'd be good. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I kind of did some hand motions whenever I was mentioning it. Me, me, sorry, so I'm typing away. Type there. Um, you was just a question about MIDI stuff. I never use MIDI stuff, and then again, I'm in a position where I always specify consoles and wings, as Mark was saying as well. Nothing I have personally against them. I just don't need to. That's fair. And I, I general just give my opinion. I gen, I don't own any MIDI gear, so I don't take anything MIDI wise. I own iPads, so I have a bunch of OSC stuff more than I do MIDI yeah, stuff. No, I, have, I, have, I have doubled me using the OSC. Mm -hmm. So that's equipment you already own. You don't have to make an extra outlay for that. Yep. Cool. Um. So the Dropbox, this, there was a question about the Dropbox, the show file. It shouldn't be made on 3.14 because that's actually um, there. The the first session I did in German was in, on 3.14, but the, this one in the Dropbox should be one which should be available in 3.13. 
if I did not do did the wrong link, but I should have been given the right one. Fine. Right I've, one. I've got it on 313 here and it's running fine. Yeah, okay, yeah. So there's nothing you can do, which you can't do actually uh, here. And 3, 314, I'm, an, I'm allowed to say that, <laughs> is uh, nothing uh, changed in, in that things here, in that scenario, 314 is only changing uh, a lot of stuff in, or some stuff in terms of the patching. Uh, one of the biggest requests is fulfilled that we get rid of the, um, per dp patching that we're gonna have like a more linear way of patching and then um make it more uh easier and uh, user friendly in that kind of way and sarah allowed me to say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah good any other questions left here let's see yes exactly jared universe can be universe universe 50 can be now universe 50. Uh, native Stream Deck support. Yes, please. I'm plus one for that. <laughs> uh, should still go on the forums. Um, I mean, I have the notes here, but still put them on the forums because that's actually what gets looked at officially. I mean, of course, if I submit it, it's going to get looked at officially, but the forums are the best place, forums.highend.com. Um, about and what the palette to palette effect uh, with more than one palette um i tend to do stuff that stuff like that in the meantime uh for example if with three color um chases stuff like that i tend to do that now with um uh, with pixel mapping because then you only have like three layers and you can easily offset those three layers um just like think of a of a straight truss where you move then um a content with a, a um, white content over that um, truss from left to right, um, make that with the with the ramp so it goes from left to right and then starts again from the left. Uh, make that with three layers and an offset of like each layer uh, 90 degrees or 120 degrees, and then you have like very easily three layers, uh, three colors uh, going from left to right and following each other. Uh, in one queue, and you can very easily alter speed and rate via the effects on that um, on that layer because you only need to alter the uh, X position with one effect, and that's even faster than playing around with the effect engine or applying a palette to palette effect with positions. Um, so that's at least a workaround for for colors. Um, uh, for sure, not for positions or other stuff, but for colors, that's a nice uh, option how you can um, create very nice and effective um, uh, pixel maps and, and color chases. Yeah, so that's it from my side. So if you, if you don't have any more questions, um, thanks a lot for watching. Um, it was very interesting for me to do that one in English, not as a native English spoken portion, but I think that worked out quite well. Otherwise, my two native English speaker here would have directly interrupted me, I guess. Um, I think this Friday sessions will continue from what I heard. So um, we will keep you posted. Um, watch out for new stuff popping up. Also, um, watch out for Megan and Noah coming up every uh, Thursday again. Was it Thursday, Megan? Yes. Thursdays at noon. Yeah. Um, the next video is going to be about scenes. Um, yeah, so then... you can redo that. And those Friday sessions will continue with uh, those guest people, like Leggy and me and other people are popping up. Um, uh, next week we are I am working with Scott Barnes on talking all about hognet networking. Oh, cool. Didn't knew that. <laughs> so um hope to see you there again soon. Stay safe, everybody. And um hope to see you soon on one of our productions again and not just in a virtual way. That would be right. great. Thanks a lot. Bye guys. <laughs> Thank y'all. Yeah.